you know, all that good stuff. And also too, so that, hey, everybody, everybody else gets to know who you are and how, you know, how you kind of go about what you do. So why don't you start off, if you could just kind of give me a quick intro for your, about a quick intro, bleh. Right now, <laughs> edit, edit. <laughs> <laughs> if you can give us a quick intro for yourself and uh how did you get your start in what you do my name is heidi hamill and i am the founder and owner of reclaimed creations i started making well let me give the intro for that um, reclaimed, reclaimed, <laughs> reclaimed creations is called that because everything that I make starts out life as a wool sweater, which I have felted and then cut up and turned into hats, mittens, and scarves. I started making mittens, oh, back in the late 80s and early 90s. I've always made Christmas presents for my family. Um, I, I grew up in the school in Rose Valley, which is based on um, the, well, the, the philosophical foundations are from the arts and crafts movement in the 1920s. So, and the and educational philosophy was from John Dewey, who was a multi-sensory teacher in the best um, mode. So the school put a lot of emphasis on doing it yourself, making it yourself, creating, including beauty in daily life, um, and the importance of learning how to make things for yourself. So um, we made apple butter when the apples fell out of the trees. We, we just did all kinds. We had shop, we had dance, we had art every day. It was wonderful. And as a very strong tact tactile kinesthetic learner, that was wonderful for me. I had a lot of internal structure but I really needed to do things. And I was a very high energy kid. So I needed to be able to go on, out and run around in the fields and the woods and climb trees and you know, blow off steam in between concentrated bouts of learning. So, and it was just great fun. Yeah, um, fun. yeah it was wonderful. And the school still exists. It's here in Rose Valley, Pennsylvania. Um, so I, I credit them and my parents for recognizing my strengths and nice. helping me through my difficulties. I, I think I was probably in my early 40s before I realized that I was dyslexic. Oh. Um, and possibly ADD, I don't know, um, but certainly dyslexic. And actually a couple of, about two years ago now, I, I confirmed that because I was reading and I saw the B turn to a D. Oh, okay. And settle down as a D. And I went, okay, all of my life, my brain has been doing that and I haven't seen it. And only now as I age, it's slowing down enough that I get to watch that happening. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> it is. It's not, it's neither good nor bad. It just yeah. is. <laughs> so I'm a wonderful spoonerism. I, I, my favorite was at midnight at some point on a long drive, I said, Oh, my favorite piece of classical music is Gataldi's Rivar Concerto. Nice. <laughs> totally comprehensible to me. <laughs> you completely understood it. I totally understood it. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it's Vivaldi's Guitar Concerto. Right. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I've, I've made presents all my life for Christmas presents uh, and birthday presents, etc. And that year, I'm... I had a hard time coming up with a project or what I would do, but I had shrunk a number of my wool sweaters by accident. And I thought, well, okay, I'll make mittens for the family out of them, which I did. They were terrible. It was a horrible <laughs> pattern. I came up with it myself. I didn't go to the store and find one. Not that I could have found one, but, um, and then I had a bunch of scraps and I said, well, I can't throw this stuff away. It's too beautiful. What shall I make with what's left? Um, hats, mittens, they go together. So I made some hats. And being my family, they wore their silly mittens and their silly hats and oh. loved them, blessed them. <laughs> and, uh, and they got better as I made more. 
Well, you got to start know, somewhere. That's right? right. Yeah. That's right. It was very clear to me right off the bat that things had to change. But it was really fascinating. And I love and have always loved wool sweaters. Um, so I started making them just for fun. And they did get better. And eventually I was, people saw them and liked them and said, oh, can you make me something? And so I would. And then I started making them more seriously while I was still working at Delaware Valley Friends School and did a neighborhood show and just got a lot of positive feedback from people. So when I got so sick that I had to quit my job and then couldn't go back to that particular job, I thought, well, after I had healed enough that I could, I could work, I, after about a year and a half, um, I thought, well, this is a relatively low stress thing to do. I can make my own schedule. I will enjoy the actual work itself. And I can, I can monitor my health and do as much as I can, but no more, because I'll be setting the expectations. Sure. So yeah. that's what I did. And it, it grew and grew and grew rapidly. And in 2007, a friend and I hit a turning point at the same point in our lives where both of us needed a studio outside the home. She, because she was having a second child, I, because I had filled up all the closets in the house and my husband was saying, please find studios. <laughs> <laughs> so we looked and we couldn't find any. So we, we, we made it happen. We rented this space and divided it up and it is now Heron Crest Studios. Nice. Now 21 artist studio. So that's where my studio is. Okay. Um, aside from COVID-19. Well, nah. that being the new normal. Yeah. <laughs> but now I'm working at home again so, <laughs> for a while. Have you filled up the closets yet? N no, the studio is full. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I go over there and pick and choose and come back. <laughs> so your husband is currently researching a cure for COVID-19 is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, which is the one really quick. So now actually I'm going to set up a room at the house and, and do some production here. So that's how I started. Interesting. Do you mind if I ask you, how old were you when you did your first project, your, your first set of mittens? Oh, gosh. Um, let me get the calculator. If you have to think about it, it was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a while ago. This is 2020, and it was 1998. So that's okay. 22 years ago. Wow. So you've been, you've been doing this, this a while. for 22 years. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And I did at the beginning, I had a broader vision. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I made, I made pocketbooks, wonderful pocketbooks out of size zero, two, four, and six trousers and skirts, mm -hmm. and then lined them with silks, silk garments. So all of it was recycled. That's hence the reclaimed and hence right. the general creations because right. I didn't want to focus. Now I'd call it Heidi's hats or, you know, wool to wear or whatever, you know, but, and that is because at one point I decided I couldn't just, I couldn't do all of those things and not do them all well. It was a different. Well, we all evolve over time. Yes. I and I couldn't sell off. wool. I couldn't sell wool hats in the winter, in the summertime. Right. So I had to come up with a summer project. Then I decided, no, I like wool. I like hats. I like mittens. I am going to stick with what I really love. The other was fun, but I'm not going to do it anymore. Right. So now I just make hats, mittens, and scarves, and fingerless mittens. Well, that makes sense. I mean, because it's, it's, you know, you've, you've found your niche where, where you work best, you're comfortable there, but you're still probably being challenged by some other things. So, yeah, I mean, why not? And that's, yes. and that's the truth, though. We all start off broad. Right. I, don't think, I don't think anybody starts off in their craft with a super specific notion. We're all kind of like, well, I'm just going to do this thing. And then you realize that there's subcategories in that. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. That and makes there's, it's like a haiku. There are, because I'm working with reclaimed materials that are constantly changing, each hat is like a five, seven, five syllable haiku. There's endless variety within that format. Right. I, have, I have basically three, maybe four patterns that I, of hats that I make. Um, and each one of them is different from the other. And after 22 years, they're still each one different from the other.
which keeps me entertained. Oh, of course. Mm. Two, buying sweaters Ooh. because I get to touch them. <laughs> And then I get to imagine what they might look like in five inch bands. I don't see the whole sweater. Right. I can take a really ugly sweater mm -hmm. as a sweater and turn it into anywhere from one to three hats um, that take sections of them or pieces of them even um, and make something really very fun. So it's um, almost like you're able to hyper where every, everyone else in the world would see it as, oh God, what an awful sweater. Right. You're able to hyper focus into that parts of it and then you can mentally take those best bits. Right. And even the bits that might not even be the best there, but apply them in another way so that they do become their best. Yes, that's right. That's right. And um, the other favorite part is, is just that. It's the designing. It's, it's mm -hmm. taking a look at the, the sweater in pieces and deciding what I'm going to do with it, what's going to be the best use of that particular color, texture, pattern, um, and what I need to make. You know, if I don't need any more mittens, I, I'm very tempted by making a pair of mittens, but I might not. <laughs> Just one pair. <laughs> Go with one of the hats. <laughs> it's like you're an addict. Okay, well, I can stop whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> No, no, I can't. <laughs> yeah, it's just go with so, it. So just the, especially the mosaic hats, which really are stained glass windows that are all smaller pieces pieced together. Those are so much fun for me oh, wow. because I'm, I'm dealing with all kinds of different, potentially fighting, but potentially harmonious pieces um, of, of sweater, of trim, of flowers, of just everything. It's great fun. That does sound like fun. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, introduce me to an artist that does not enjoy shopping for their for their materials. Yes. Uh, you know, it's right. like it's like, oh, do you want to go bead shopping? Twist my arm. Just yeah. like, <laughs> you know, it's, well, and just kind of a little sideline on that. Where do you shop for your sweaters then? So do you go to like Goodwill? Do you go to secondhand stores or do you shop re like full on retail? Like where, or is it wherever you find them? It's more the latter. Um, I mean, wherever I find them. I don't ever use something new. Those oh, okay. are way too expensive and that's not the point. The point is to make something beautiful, beautiful out of something that has been discarded, mm. to give it a new life a new beauty, a new function, so it can continue to be a useful part and a beautiful part of someone's life. Um, I have been a confirmed reuser of things my entire life. I make my own bread, I have a garden, I compost everything that I possibly can, I recycled the rest, the scraps in my studio are like this big. <laughs> um, so you found a use for them too. <laughs> and I usually do, and I make little leaves this big. <laughs> So um, I, I have, initially I started using my own sweaters that I was going to give up or had already accidentally shrunk because uh, everything goes through the freezer, the hot water wash, the and the hot dryer before I cut into it. And sometimes two or three times if it doesn't felt down enough because that blends the colors. It doesn't, like this t-shirt has, you can see it's got distinct edges right. between colors. If this were a piece of wool and I put it in the, in the washing machine and dryer, it would, those boundaries would no longer be as distinct. And it gives a very soft, um, almost heathered tone to even the most vibrant sweaters. It's like a gradient feel when yes. you transition from one color to the next, it allows the fibers to kind of- They, they, they literally barb together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, what was the question? <laughs> I, I just, so where do I get my materials? Find right. your stuff, you know. Yeah. Right. So then I started looking into thrift stores and particularly Goodwill outlet stores because I can take a cashmere sweater that has one or two holes in it 
mm. which is going to get thrown out. Right. Either to land up in a landfill or be burned, putting pollutants into the air or at least fibers into the air and reuse it because I wash it. It's not, you know, I make sure they're moth proof and I can work around the holes. Sure. I mean, well, if you're cutting everything up and repiecing, right. the holes don't. They're immaterial. Anything. Yeah. Right. And in fact, I would prefer those because I'm not depriving anyone of a good sweater. That way, that can be reused as a garment. So, and then, and I did that for many, 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 many years. I, I gave up going to yard sales because you can never find enough in any one place. Right. So, so I went to Goodwill, out, Goodwill outlets. Um, I know everyone in the area, um, and even the new ones. Some of the old ones have left. So sad. And, and, um, and then about. Gosh, it must be about five years ago now. Well, and in the beginning, when I was still so so sick and couldn't work very much, that was the one thing I could do. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could spend half an hour in a thrift store and then come home and rest. Right. So I collected quite a few during those early period, sure. early years. And then about five years ago, a friendly colleague of mine who also was working in wool and reclaimed wool decided that she wanted to focus on white and ivories for bridesmaids. Plus she was doing all kinds of other stuff. She's one of these multi-talented mm -hmm. people. So furniture and all kinds of stuff. And she gave me her sweater collection. Wow. She wouldn't let me pay her for it. It was a gift. Aww. It was the most amazingly generous gift. And she had very good taste and was in a different market than, than I was. So we weren't even overlapping each other. So I have, at that point, I said, I cannot go to thrift stores any longer. So sad. Because <laughs> I love shopping for sweaters. You have too many. Because <laughs> I have too many. It's absurd. But well, she, and she promised me that when I quit doing this, I will hand on everything that I have. And so I will. Yep. Well, and that's the funny thing about that is that I think that's why it's so important for artists to get to know other artists yes. and especially to be open to getting to know young artists who are yes. just getting established because <clears throat> it is stuff like that, like, you know, taking the materials that you'll never use or if you're just done with a certain thing. Right. Passing it on, not charging for it, de-stashing in the best possible way so that the next generation, it's a welcome, it's a welcome mat for the next Yes, generation. yes. And they can get a start. At yeah. No well, cost. The supplies are the hard, one of the hardest things yeah. to really get stocked up on. Right. right. Yeah. And especially understanding the good stuff. Yes. That makes a difference. Yes. And, and by having somebody older who's been there, done that, got the t-shirt, made all the mistakes, say, okay, right here's what you really want to use because you might spend more up front, but you'll spend less replacing it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, it's worth buying a good machine, mm -hmm. not a cheap one because it will last so much longer and give you so much more service. Absolutely. The right Feel tool. Yeah. yeah. It's What is the hardest thing about what you do? The hardest thing for me to learn, well, two things are, are hard. Um, one is organization of scrap. Mm -hmm. Because I generate so many large pieces when I'm really producing, when I'm in a heavy production mode. Uh, when it's when I'm really focused on that, then I'm not don't have any other distractions, which might happen two or three times a year max. Um, then I can cut a whole sweater up into all its various pieces, store them ready to match with other things. Um, but I still have pieces of scrap that will go into the mosaics, and to coordinate all of that so that it's easy to access and easy to design with is always a challenge. Mm. Um, so I have to resort my studio scrap. If if I were doing it, you know, to my my boss's liking, um, I would do it three times or four times a year. 
Okay. Um, but it happens maybe twice a year if I'm lucky. So that's hard. The other hard part has been learning this um, virtual sales stuff. It, just because it's new for me. Um, I'm, I'm a real interactive person. I love talking with people in my booth at a craft show. I love helping people figure out what looks good on them. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy that. Most people seem to enjoy that, doing that with me. I, I don't know how many people I've shown how to wear a hat so they look well in a hat um, because they come in saying, I look terrible in hats. And it, you know, you have to gently say, it's how you wear a hat that makes the difference. Right. And I'll bet I can show you if you get, if you let me, if you're willing to experiment with me, let's see if we can find a way to wear a hat that looks well on you because I bet we can. And here's some, here's some things to consider. So I love that part. Mm -hmm. I just love that part. And I'm, I am trying to figure out how to incorporate that into my current virtual sales, which is on my website. It's not <laughs> interactive. My husband had a great idea. He said, make schedule Zoom appointments, like office hours or, or shop hours, where if someone wants to make an appointment to look at how to wear a hat or what hat's going to look good on me, we can talk about it as I would at a show. That is a good idea. Yeah. And it's funny because I think we're all missing craft shows, you know, yes. all really, because it's more than obviously making money is a really big part of it. Yes. But it's also, you miss the customers. You miss yes. talking to people. Yes. You miss your friends that you see, see like there. ones you run into right. at every show and right. you know, that camaraderie. And also I think it's because especially when you have a tactile product, yes, it's very, very difficult because it's like, if only you could reach out and feel this, you'd right. be like, amazed and right. not having that does make selling digitally so hard it and, does and it's gonna sadly it it's gonna be with us for a while yep craft shows will happen again eventually when um, there's a yeah when there's a good vaccine that and yeah when everybody's it, getting right when it's safe right. when we're all vaccinated right <clears throat> but until then Right. We have to find ways of adapting. And I find it amazing how creative so many people have become mm -hmm. in finding ways of kind of bridging some of those gaps. And I love the idea of a Zoom appointment. I think that's great where you could do yeah. like, hey, I can help you learn how to wear a hat. <laughs> yes. Because, oh, yes. yeah, of course. Who you know? knew there, was way, there were ways to wear hats? <laughs> I didn't know that until I started making them. Other than shoving them on your head. I think most yeah. people are like, well, you just put it on your head, right? Right, no. You know, well, what if you have really long hair? What if you have no hair? What if you, right. you know, that's all going to make a difference. What's the, what's the cross section of your head look like? Is it round? Is it oval? It's not the shape of your face. It's, you know, if you were to slice this way, what's the shape of your head? Oh, so it's like and, this way. Yeah. So if you, were, if you were to slice this way and lift off the cap, you know, what's, what's the, what shape is your skull that, in that dimension? Right. And where are your ears on your head? Who knew that people's ears are higher on their head and lower on their head? But if you want to cover your ears with a hat, you need to know how deep is the crown of your head so right. that you have a hat that's deep enough to cover your ears. And I have to make hats that are going to cover your ears. Right. I mean, when I started, I went around and measured all my friends' heads. <laughs> Because I didn't know. <laughs> no. I measure your head. Okay. <laughs> I guess your friends know you knew you well enough to be like, all right, this is just what Heidi does. What advice would you give to someone who's just getting started in what you do? Be patient. Pay attention, listen to what customers tell you, try and find the kernel of what it is that they're saying it, not how they're saying it, and 
balance what you think customers want with what you want to make. Find something that addresses, find a way to make what you want in a way that people like. If you want sales, I mean, if right. you're not doing it to get money or, or if money is not an issue, then by all means, go with where your heart goes. But it is possible to make what you want to make that will sell um, if you listen very carefully and if you do your research, if you do informal or formal focus groups when you start a new product and, and remember that it will take time and that there's always room for improvement. And if you get bored, your work will be boring. Hmm. So give yourself a challenge on a regular basis. I, I try and give myself a design or an administrative challenge each spring when my, my, my work, well, when I have, cra when I had craft shows in the spring, fall, <laughs> right. I only sell, but I really only sell between September and January. Wool. It's a wool hat. Yeah. yeah. A cold weather product. So, um, in the, the spring, that's when I have a little bit more control over my time. And I try and give myself a design challenge or an administrative challenge each year or an organizational challenge. Right. Spring. Because, I mean, my work is inherently not boring, but, you know, doing the same thing for years, a little old. Well, so, yeah. But also it's, it's important to, to recognize that, you know, it's, it's a constant growth. Yes. It's not like, okay, I've done it and I've arrived. <laughs> you right. never really arrive. It's no. the journey. <laughs> right. Right. It is. And that, yeah. And the challenges have to be in more than just your art, but also in how you handle your supplies and how you handle your, you know, what am I going to do to improve how things run? Right. Because you, very few people realize that by running the back end well gives you more space in your brain to do the creative stuff. Right. So that if you want to be really creative, get really organized. Yes. Yes. Hence organization of scrap. Yeah. <laughs> Being the hardest thing. Being the hardest thing. <laughs> What do you want to say to the next generation of artists? Please recycle. Please reuse the earth's valuable resources. Don't throw, don't buy something that you're going to throw away next year because it's unraveled or it's broken. Please fix things, mend things, reuse things, buy your clothes at a thrift store share clothes with each other, um, give stuff away, accept other things willingly from other people. Don't go, oh, somebody else has this. Ugh. That's not, no, it belongs. If it's on earth, it needs to be useful in some way. And it will have, have, it will have in its lifetime many, many, many different uses. So please, try your best to purchase things mindfully mm -hmm. um, with a longer term in mind beyond tomorrow. Think 10 years, is this going to still be with me in 10 years? And right. if it isn't, can I see what else I can do with it or find someone else who would need it? And then on the receiving end of that, be thankful for that. Don't say, Oh, this pizza pan has stains on it. Well, Yes, but they're not going to hurt you. And you don't need well, a new one if someone's willing to give you and a perfectly good use one. Sometimes it means seasoning. You yes. Know, getting old cookware is actually sometimes a really good thing because it's, it it's used. It's broken in. It's, you know, right. yeah. And give yourself as much beauty in your life as possible. And get your exercise. <laughs> Stay healthy.
if you're ever going to do a craft show, you better know how to lift. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because it is a workout. It is. And then the purples and then the oranges. It's just, it's very fun. Yeah, it sounds fun. You must have an epic lint trap. Your lint trap must be so like. Yeah, it gets cleaned every, and actually I saved the lint. I was going to say, you probably yeah, could. I did. Well, I did. Something else. Yeah, well, there was, I used to give it away to a woman, a wonderfully talented woman in Southern Jersey um, who painted pictures with different colored felted wool. Oh, okay. Of, 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 of fluff. Right. Like, mm, what do you call it? Fold. No, no. Um, oh, the word just left my brain. Did you see it? No. no um, sure. uh, if I did, not did not. Batting. What do you, what, what, what's the word for the wool Bat? after it's been carted? Carded. Oh. There's a specific word for that. I cannot believe I cannot remember that. I'm not, I'm actually allergic to wool. So like, I don't know oh. much about it. Okay. <laughs> the thought makes you itch. Okay. Um, anyway, <laughs> I take that and I, I, now she doesn't, she's no longer living. And so I, I, I store it. I, I, I sort it in paper bags by color because <laughs> I love to sort. And, um, and I'm starting to experiment. This is my design challenge for, for 2021. Oh, okay. I'm starting to experiment with what can I do with that? How does it work? You know, are the barbs of the wool still there enough that I can felt it? And because I've started making um, an ornament that is kind of like a leaf oh, out of, okay. of felted wool so that I can, it, the edges don't ra unravel. Right. And um, I can cut it and stitch it down the middle so that it curls up nicely. And that would be, about how much I could get out of a, a piece of dryer lint or a ball of dryer lint. And lots of people make um, dryer balls out of them, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> I want to make something not, ornamental. Not interesting enough. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Not hard enough. <laughs> yeah, really. Let's, <laughs> I like let's challenges. Make, let's make things as difficult as humanly possible. Absolutely. That of makes course. them more interesting. I, I'm just as guilty of <laughs> Good. It really hard. You will never be bored. I absolutely, and you know what, the funny thing is too, is that I find that people get, when, when people come into my booth and they see something that I did that was like stupid hard for me to do, mm -hmm. and the whole time I was making it, I was like, why am I doing this? And then when they come in and they're like, I didn't know that could, that could exist. It's like, right. okay, mission accomplished. That's why right. I did it. Right. Because, because it's hard. Right. That's right. <laughs> And you just have to accept the angst that goes along with that, the occasional angst that goes along with that. Right. Because right. it's, it's part of the joy at the end of the road. Yeah. Or when you're done with that and it works. You see that final product and you're going, oh yeah, yeah, that was actually pretty awesome. Right. So. Right. And it's usually easier than...